report uh, on optimization of peritoneal dialysis prescription so this is actually an academic initiative brought to you by mcure in uh, coordination with uh, a kidney education research network which is an educational ngo uh, by dr vijay kesar thank you so much sir for uh, giving us this opportunity to collaborate with you and uh, give this uh, beautiful program to the uh, dm dnb students so this is a virtual uh, video conferencing based platform where students across india can connect with the eminent nephrologists of india it is specifically meant for dm dnb students who are in second or third year and about to move to the next phase of their academic or professional life uh, it will help the student in finding solution to their unmet needs ranging from their curriculum to their queries related to setting up their clinic and uh, medical legal issues linked to it so this is the flow of the program so it will begin with a presentation and a case scenario discussion for over 30 35 minutes uh, followed by q and a session Uh, which will be addressed by all the eminent faculty that we have today with us, and it is a fortnightly program uh, held on uh, Fridays at 7 p.m. So, uh, so request you to please post your questions in the Q and A box so that uh, your queries can be answered. And in case if you log out of the program, then you can log in again by joining the same link. Uh, next, please. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, thank you so much sir for giving us this opportunity. Uh, Dr. Vijay Sir, Khesh Sir is the course coordinator for this program. Uh, let's see next slide. Yeah, uh, we also welcome and thank Dr. Professor A K Bhalla Sir uh, for uh, moderating today's program. He is chairman and HOD Department of Nephrology at Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi. He has been awarded Padma Shri by the President of India in 2010. Also awarded Vishisht Chikitsa Ratan Award by Delhi Medical Association. Uh, he has also been um, winner of Dr. B C Roy Award by M C I in 2018. He's been past vice president of Indian Society of Nephrology, president of Society of Renal Nutrition and Metabolism, past president of Delhi Delhi Nephrology Society, and president of Indian Society of Nephrology North Zone since 2018. Uh, over to you, sir, and uh, to welcome our speaker, uh, Dr. Datta sir. Over to you, sir, Dr. Bhalla sir. Thank you. At the outset, I would like to thank um, Professor Vijay K for uh, 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 initiating this wonderful mentor speech program. It is very educative for uh, especially DMB students and DM students, uh, final year students. And uh, I will I also thank him for giving me the opportunity to moderate uh, this today's talk. Now today's speaker is a very experienced nephro senior nephrologist of country, Dr. Arup Ratan Datta. he is a pgi uh, chandigarh alumni we were together at pgi chandigarh he is director for this hospital and kidney institute kolkata he has a, a vast experience of more than 31 years and he is uh, expert in uh, peritoneal dialysis and transplantation in fact he is uh, the founder member of peritoneal dialysis society of india and has served as its president he he is a very astute clinician and in addition i always uh, call him as a great scientist and physicist because he likes to go into the details of for, uh, kinetics of any system in the body so that is the, uh, it's unique feature to him and with that introduction i request dr datta to discuss today's topic that is optimization of peritoneal dialysis prescription peritoneal dialysis has been especially proven as a boon especially in covid 19 Um, time because uh, there were problems with hemodialysis, and somehow our DM DNB students are losing interest in this very important renal replacement therapy. In fact, I I I am I was also the founder of this um, member of Peritoneal Dialysis Society of India and had keen interest in PD, but somehow it is uh, sorry to say that this therapy is losing its uh, importance as a machine. and I, there are very few nephrologists left in the country who are actually pursuing pd as a renal replacement therapy so i'm sure dr uh, roop datta will uh, stress on how to write the prescription of peritoneal dialysis we will like to have both uh, uh, theoretical as well as practical tips also on this topic professor datta please
Thank you very much. Uh, at the outset, good evening, and at the outset, I must uh, thank Dr. Kher and Dr. Balda to choose me for this presentation. And I echo the sentiments of Dr. Balda that uh, being almost the, uh, having remained at the forefront of PD, we also are watching that with time, the PD is decaying in, the, in this country. That has been one of the reasons why I chose this topic. And uh, I sincerely hope that the students, I believe most of the audience here would be students, they take a keen interest in PD. And I hope that your respective centers are actually doing uh, can you view the slide? I'm not sure. It's not showing on my screen. It just went off. Uh, no, sir. You have to share. share. Okay. Yeah. Is it okay now? No. no sir. I can see it on my screen. No, you have to share the screen, sir. I, I did that, but something went wrong. One sec. Not going? No. Not yet. Okay. Let me... Not yet. Uh, no, sir. If you want uh, to share it with me, I'll go. Uh... Sorry for the thing, but when we started it, it was all fine. I, because the screen changed, I think this went off. Let me let me call the IT yeah. guy. Just one second. Yeah. presentation to share shared with China. Yeah, now share. it's is there. Yeah. Okay, done. Okay. You can go to the first slide, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay now? Yeah. Yes, okay. So sorry for the hitch. It's kind of we are all learning on this. On this. So I would assume uh, right at the start that most of the audience here have been exposed to peritoneal dialysis, at least to some extent. So the very basics, obviously, we are all discussing here, and I really hope that you are taking interest in peritoneal dialysis also. Now, within peritoneal dialysis, the two most discussed topics are number one fluid overload in peritoneal dialysis and adequacy aspects of peritoneal dialysis. And uh, they are generally dealt with separately. If you go to any PD conference or even otherwise, you'll find them as separate topics. Now, I always felt that these two are actually the, the two sides of the same coin. And generally in this talk, I'm going to focus on the areas where these two things come together, the adequacy and the fluid overload. So I will not be following a standard uh, textbook format of, of, and my talk is not going to be comprehensive on either of these two topics, or rather I will be focusing mainly on the physiological aspects, which will make you understand this, the, the fluid kinetic, the fluid and the solid kinetic a uh, little better, and that's the, uh, the primary purpose of this talk. Now, when you approach a patient of peritoneal analysis, uh, there are several variables. And these variables lie partly within the patient and partly with the therapy. So what are the patient variables? First is a body size. And the patient can be overweight, underweight. An overweight patient can be overweight because of fattiness or because of muscle. But that, that makes a difference in the body water content. So one has to be conscious about that. The transport status, the peritoneal membrane characteristic, the diabetic status, and most importantly, the residual renal function. On the therapy side, 
we have four types of solutions, the 1.5, 2.5, the 4.5 solution, which is not very much used nowadays, and the 7.5% iCode extreme. So there are four varieties of solution. And one can use one bag, two bag, three bag, if you are doing incremental, or four bags, or you can do APD. And the, another very important variable on which this talk uh, will really touch uh, much of that is the concentration and the dwell time optimization. Uh, I will explain this in a while. Now, to understand these kinetics, I will just explain a few graphs, which you will be coming in. You will see these graphs in any PD talk. Uh, uh, about there are four or five such uh, pictures which make you understand the physiology of peritoneal dialysis. Now, if you if you put a bag of PD fluid in a patient's body and allow that to dwell, what is happening basically the urea curtain are diffusing into the fluid. So the concentration is gradually increasing. Now, in that, when you if you if you look at the top curve, that's the urea curve. The urea is being a small molecule, the transport is the fastest. So within about two, 40 minutes, that's about four hours time, the urea is almost completely saturated, which means from the plasma, whatever is there is going to come to the peritoneal fluid that has already come at the, and the levels are almost the same, which means there won't be any further, uh, you know, transport of urea into the fluids. So to maximally utilize those two liters of solution, and if you want to take out urea, keeping it longer is not going to help you take out much more urea than that, than whatever you have done in the first few hours, because it has reached a plateau. So it is, it is the volume which becomes a more important thing at that point. So it reaches a plateau after a few hours, and a longer dwell is not going to be incremental. But if you, if you look at the lower curve, and now this lower curve is one of inulin and even lower is of protein, which has got a much, much higher molecular weight. So the transport rates are much slower. So obviously these are not saturated in, uh, in about four hours time. And if you look at creatinine is 300 inulin, it's around 5,000. You see that by four hours time, hardly anything has really gone in the fluid. In the, in the fluid. So for a large molecule clearance, more important is time that the, 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 the dwell time has to be much, much longer for you to extract something. So this is important if you do, uh, we used to do peritoneal analysis, uh, like I'll show you in the case that I'll be uh, demonstrating, that we often did the, only the daytime dialysis, the nighttime is to be free, but you actually lose out on the large molecular weight clearance if you do only the daytime thing. So it's the contact time which is more important there. For a large molecule, the continuous contact is better. So what are our goals of therapy? What are we trying to do? We want to remove small solute, we want to remove large molecules, and we want to also remove the fluid. Now for small molecule, as I told you, what is important thing is the volume, because the, the fluid gets saturated in about four hours time. It is not going to take you any longer. And it is kind of 100% saturated with urea. So it's kind of a sarro surrogate. The, the volume is a surrogate of the urea clearance. So if you use six liters of fluid, you get a, a certain clearance. So if you use eight liters of fluid, that will also become completely saturated. It takes, takes out more small cells. And for a large molecule, it is a time. So it's a contact time is much more important. So if a 24 hours contact time is better than a 16 hour contact time. For fluid removal, what is important is the glucose and the time, the glucose concentration and the time over which you are actually dwelling that fluid. Other than glucose concentration and dwell time, the third important factor for ultrafiltration is the peritoneal transport time. As you understand, the, the solution is hyperosmolar. And because of this osmolar gradient, the fluid draws in the uh, fluid from the plasma, the peritoneal fluid. But with time, the glucose from the fluid, which is the main reason why it is more osmotically active, gets diffused into the blood. So, and then the osmotic gradient is lost over the time. So in patients who have the high transport type, this osmotic gradient is lost very fast. So although they have a better urea gradient clearance in the sense that they also come faster into the fluid, but the glucose gradient is lost pretty fast. And then they, their ultrafiltration capacity is also lost. So you have to remember these three things when you think of ultrafiltration. 
So with that, I will come to our index case. I will be moving back and forth between the case and a bit of physiology just to demonstrate the points here. So this was a 52-year-old male businessman. He had diabetic nephropathy, which progressed to ESRD. This is one of our early cases, and I intentionally kept it just to show us what problems we had at, at, that, at that time. It didn't have a clear transplant prospect. Nowadays, of course, we will encourage transplant at 52. Uh, he lives, he used to live in Calcutta, but he used to travel frequently to the smaller town, 300 kilometers away. And there were no hemodialysis facilities in uh, 2020, in about three, 400 kilometers from Calcutta. So uh, he, he chose PD, and mainly for the logistic reason, because when he traveled, he would travel with a base supply and then, you know, that kind of thing he used to do and then get the fluid over there. So his residual output was around 600 ml. So his PD was initiated at another center, actually. Uh, he had, was on three exchanges, and it was put on uh, the daytime, I guess we used to call it a DAPD, that's daytime ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, which in the night used to be dry. And with that, he could manage an artery pressure volume of about one, one liter, and he was doing reasonably well. So two months after the initiation, he came with, uh, with an episode of flu over and Throughout this presentation, he actually came with four episodes of fluid overload, and basically that's what I'm trying to demonstrate here. The first one was just two months after the initiation. He had a seven kilo weight gain, which happened over two weeks. The view of his logs show that. His salt and water intake was not controlled. His chart review showed that he was using exclusively 1.5% bags, despite the progressive weight gain. So when I asked him that why he didn't exclusively use 1.5, he said that he was afraid of using higher concentration as this might cause hyperglycemia and that he was also not sure that if he could alter the unit's prescription. A certain prescription was given to him and uh, it had a combination of 1.5 and 2.5. He got afraid about the glucose so he started 1.5 all and he got fluid overloaded because he was not drawing out enough. So you see here that the statement of the patient was correct that he was worried about the hyperglycemia. It's better if you can manage with 1.5, but the emphasis of, from the unit was definitely incorrect because he was obviously, he must have the flexibility of using using the bags. Otherwise, the entire prescription is going to go It's not just, it's like driving a car with a fixed steering. That that doesn't happen. So we we corrected that. We just went back to this, his previous prescription and he became more right. So six months after, he was doing well after that, and six months after his initiation, he came back again with a fluid retention. And we looked at his logs and we checked him, we found that his peritoneal articulation had decreased to about 50% of the previous. And his residual output, which we measured, we found that that was unchanged. So, we, so, the, so the question is, why would the peritoneal articulation suddenly drop? So when we asked him, we found out that 10 days back, his prescription was altered from a daytime ambulatory dialysis to, uh, to CAP, but he was on three exchanges already. So previously he was compressing the exchanges. Now he is doing eight hour dwells, and previously he was doing about four, five hour dwells. So uh, why was it done? Because somebody felt that it is better to have a continuous exchange, which is of course theoretically correct. But in this case, there, it brought in uh, some kind of a different problem. So although this is theoretically advantageous because a better medium or a large molecular clearance, as I told you, that in the first slide, that for to 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 capture the large molecules, you need a more dwell time. So of course that is theoretically advantageous. But this particular prescription alteration did not capture his peak artery filtration. He was a high average transporter, so high average to high transporter. So which means he needed a short dwell because otherwise he was losing the complete artery filtration. What happens if you give a fluid? Uh, you you can, I'll I'll show it in the next slide. Like if you get two liters, it expands over time. And then beyond four to six hours, it will start decreasing again because of back filtration. So in order to capture the artery filtration, you have to train when the artery filtration is maximum. So he was losing because it went to eight hours. He was losing. Uh, he could not capture the, the, the peak of the artery filtration. So obvious answer was if you could do four exchanges. And so that was, of course, the first thing, right? Then he had financial problems. And this was very much apparent in the initial days of PD. It, it still is a problem. And he said that he is unable to actually do this. So he returned, he was returned on it, the daytime thing, and his fluid overload just vanished. So, what are the guiding principles? 
the guiding principle would be that the date, the dwell time should be long enough to ensure an optimal saturation because you want to take out the solutes. And just that long to achieve adequate ultrafiltration. If you keep it in longer, it will lose the ultrafiltration. And we try to achieve this by a lower glucose solution, by as low a glucose solution as, as much as possible. And as shown in this particular case, avoiding reverent failure and fluid overload is more important than achieving a clearance target. Clearance target can sometimes be theoretical. If a patient is remaining all right, and then what you see that whether he's overall okay or not, there shouldn't be any fluid overload also. So let's look at, look at the characteristics of the solutions that we have. So, you know, these 1.5 dextrose, 2.5 dextrose, and the 4.25 dextrose, they are different in their osmolar capacity. And the icodextrin, what we have, the icodextrin is closest to the normal plasma. Normal plasma is 285, and icodextrin is 2, 285. And icodextrin, the ultrafiltration happens because of a different mechanism. It is isosmolar almost, but it is more like a colloidal osmotic pressure, which draws in the fluid. And icodextrin doesn't get absorbed into the plasma, so it stays like that, so it is good for long drills, and it draws in really a long, long of fluid when you keep it long. And if you look at the dextrose solutions, even the 1.5% dextrose is a little hyper smaller, and progressively the 4.25 is very high, and we don't use the 4.25 nowadays that much. Now this is a very important slide, which you need to, need to understand. So the, the 1.5 dextrose is known as 1.36 glucose so you you know the difference a little now you see here that this that the stronger the solution the more is the ultrafiltration which is obvious and therefore the ultrafiltration can remain for a longer length of time if you see the 1.5 here that is the good curve you see the peak ultrafiltration is reached at about three three and a half hours and if you don't train at that time you're going to have a back, back diffusion by after five six hours it will start back diffusing, even to lose that, the patient is going to get full overloaded. 2.25 is a little better, and of course, the 4.25 is going to be the best. And whereas, if you see the icodextrin, the, the kinetics are completely different because there is no absorption of the uh, from the, uh, the icodextrin, doesn't get into the blood so much, so therefore, the osmotic gradient is maintained. And over even 10, 12, 14 hours, also, the articulation capacity of the fluid remains. So therefore, this is very good for long drills. It is for a long time, uh, for about a 10 hour window, 10, 12 hour window, it is as good as a 4.25. It is actually better. And it also preserves the peritoneal function. We are not being so much hyper or smaller. But I also draw your attention to here at the center. If you can see the cursor here, watch this particular area. What it says that if you are give, giving short dwells, or if you're going the standard dwell time for four, five, six hours, then icodextrin is not doesn't give you much more ultrafiltration. It is the same as as a 2.25. It is, it is the same as a 2.25 percent glucose solution. The advantage is there when you keep the icodextrin longer, because if you keep it for eight ten hours, the 2.5 would have already reabsorbed by that time here. But the icodextrin will give you more ultrafiltration. But we don't use other icodextrin for short drills. Then it will function almost similar as a 2.5 percent. So we come back to the case, two years after the initiation. So the next two years was fine for him. So two years after the initiation, patient came back with a gradual weight gain and lethargy and less appetite. His creatinine had risen from 7.5% to 10 milligram. So this is a, there's a very clear loss of residual renal function. His urine output was low. His urine output was not 6700 as it used to be before. And you can easily know it from the, from the creatinine. The creatinine. There's a lot of creatinine which comes out of the creatinine of the urine. So somebody, when people lose the residual renal function, the creatinine is the first thing that starts going up. So the options were discussed with him at that time. So one option was to shift to him on we used to offer back then, because that used to be less expensive. And, and obviously, being on PD, his uh, options were four exchanges CAPD or the addition of hyperextrin, and you could modify the prescription accordingly. You could four exchange of the standard, or you can use our hyperextrin uh, initially, or maybe twice a week, something like that. You can work about uh, all those prescriptions. He opted to increase the, num the number of exchanges, and he remained on peritoneal dialysis, and he, he did well after that. This particular episode went away. 
So four years after the initiation, now he now comes with a, he's now, he now understands the most of the uh, thing by, by himself. He's quite a veteran on the, on the TV, but he still comes again with a massive overload and the respiratory distress. And we found that there are no records kept over the three weeks. And reportedly, he was saying that there were poor artificial patients, but the no records were kept. And he appears a bit depressed over the loss of his parent. So the quickest way of gaining control of a fluid overload case, even if he's on peritoneal dialysis, is to temporarily do a few hemodialysis. That's the quickest way that you can get control over him. And he's admitted in any case. You put in a catheter and you get two, three hemodialysis and take out the fluid quickly. And if that happens very nicely, we could uh, achieve a loss of about 12 kilos over the next three, four days. And then we started PD in a hospital setup just to understand what is happening. And we began that when, after achieving the U of Arabia. And one thing we had, we had a, uh, in the differential diagnosis, we had an outflow, outflow problems. We had an issue of whether there was any leakage or not. Leakage is you know, when, what happens. Mostly they are early on, that happens early on. A leakage can happen when the peritoneal fluid leaks from around the catheter entry site into the peritoneum, into the tissues, into the tissues of the abdominal wall. And then it is sometimes very, very difficult to detect. The, the wall gets swollen and then the patient's body eventually gets swollen. You think it is an artery filtration failure. Actually, it is not an artery filtration failure. It's, it's a leakage. So for, to diagnose leakage, you have to observe the dialysis. Uh, that's, that's the best way. So we, that was in the differential diagnosis. So we did a 4.2 for 2.5% uh, uh, PET, just to understand whether it is artery filtration failure or not. There was no artery filtration failure because they are having a 650 hour UF at about four hours. So that PET does not exclude an artery filtration failure. His DYP creatinine was 0.7, which means that his kinetics was also more or less all right, whatever we had expected. And we also looked at the one hour sodium dip. What happens? If you if you do a, 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 a PD, uh, if you draw the fluid and after one hour, if you check the sodium within the peritoneal fluid, you find there's a dip. Because the first hour, the aquaponins are uh, kind of engaged, and there's a lot of fluid which comes in the fluid, not so much the sodium. So you, there's a known as the sodium saving, and so you find a dip in the sodium uh, one hour after the after you begin the peritoneal dialysis. So this is a separate topic I'm just briefly mentioning here. So there was an 8% dip in the, in the sodium. This indicates that the aquaporin, that the membrane, that the membrane function is intact. So this patient really did not have any artery filtration problem. It did not have any, any other adequacy issues also. His peritoneum was perfectly all right. Then why did he, why did he get the overloaded? His thing was mainly non-compliance. And he was depressed because of his father's thing and he was not doing the exchange as well. Probably he was doing less exchanges. So the point that I'm trying to bring here that this patient over the four years time presented four times with different causes of fluid overload. First episode at two months was because of the inadequate training. The six months fluid overload was because of an incorrect prescription that was a well-intentioned prescription, but it was incorrect for him, given his own financial constraints. At two, two years' time, there was a clear loss of the uh, residual renal function. In fact, he did well because most of the residual renal function is lost in the first year, most of it. But he had maintained up, up, up to two years. And on the fourth year, he had non compliance and depression, giving life to two overload, which kind of mimicked an artery depression failure, a two artery depression failure, which it was not actually. Subsequent to this, after another year, the special underwent the transplantation. His, his wife came forward. He had. Um, solved his family issues by that time and he, he did well after that. So that is his story, but from this way I try to make make out some points. So now the point that I want to mention about fluid overload, again this is not a lecture on fluid overload only, so I'm just not going to be comprehensive of fluid overload, but just a few tips. Because most fluid overloads are caused by incorrect prescription and non-compliance, like in this case, rather than true artery filtration failure. Actual artificial failure is like quite quite rare that way. It happens in only the very, very long term patients or after a peritonitis when the peritoneal membrane integrity is lost. So, fluid balance training, this is what I tell everyone, is to be reinforced by the PD consultant. Like when a patient has been, you know, they have been trained by the PD nurse, by all the other doctors. And I think the consultant should himself 
give about 10 15 minutes before the charging stations about this fluid balance about what the fluids are fluids are about the concentrations are about the concentration of the real time optimization and to more importantly to explain that the flexible choice of the bags so it is not a fixed thing uh, so i often give this example that you don't drive with the fixed steering you have to constantly do the steering it's like that the patient must under understand what's happening what's the output position that they're achieving and they should have a little bit of flexibility in using using the bags the rising creatinine is very often an early indication of declining vascular renal function along with fluid retention and and awake and unless directly observed patients usually report wrong wrongly this is my experience the patient said okay i'm passing 700 and my urine output is okay i'm going five times but mostly their subject is wrong it's a very easy way is to just ask them to bring their whole urine over to the stage so when they're coming for for a follow-up you just ask them that you collect your whole day's urine from the previous day before you come to the hospital so it's a very then you can observe it what they mean 700 can actually be 200 and for food overload sodium restriction is the key so that's because capacity of the sodium removal in pd is kind of limited an unrestricted salt intake with deep sodium retention and a consequent ec of expansion and this would necessitate more use of hypertonic exchanges you will not be able to manage it with 1.5 you have to use more 2.5 4.5 originally and the end effect will be weight gain and hyperglycemia so sodium restriction sodium restriction right from the start will prevent food overload and also you know, prevent eventual weight gain and, and hyperglycemia. So that's a point that you have to remember right from the start of the So now I will show you the, I'll focus on the areas where this ultrafiltration and the, and the solid kinetics, they, they kind of go hand in hand. So all of you know about the peritoneal liquid depression test. I'm not going to discuss it there. So we used to do that routinely in all cases at our initial when we, when we began PD. Now we don't do it so much, we, we do it when we have a problem, but it is always good to do that. As Dr. Kerr always used to say that there are certain things that we need to need to go on doing, whether we are utilizing every day for every patient, that's a different matter, but just to keep on the habit. And I also will add, just, just to understand the physiology of things, it is always good to do some, uh, some pet test, even if you don't want to do it on all cases, but at least on some cases, just to keep the practice going. So, Traditionally, this is the, the PET test is done to understand the solute kinetics. And we try to, uh, we make the calculation to categorize the patient, whether they are high transporters or low transporters or kind of average transporters. But I want to bring to your attention that if you look at the patient's log, then also you get to understand that without even doing a formal PT. Uh, PT. So some of us uh, used to say, Dr. Navneet used to say that every exchange is a PET. So and I also say that, that every exchange, if you look at the log, every exchange the patient does will give you some idea about his peritoneal kinetics. If you look at the drain volume, that's an, that's an indirect marker of the solute exchange. The solute exchange will eventually, we are looking at urea creatinine there, is also the glucose which is happening. So for a high transporter, the glucose gradient will be lost, so they'll have less ultrafiltration. So if you have a patient who obviously has lost less ultrafiltration, it's likely to fall on high average high tech. And the converse is true for the low. So if you have a less than 100%, less than 100 ml uh, 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 artificial volume after four hours from a 2.5% solution, it's very likely that this patient's transfer status is high. It's a fast transporter. If it's more than 700, then obviously you've got a low transporter. That's a slow transporter. And in the middle lies the average. So you, have, you can, from the long tip, you can get an idea about what kind of a transport patient, uh, transport patient this patient has. But you should always I mean, also follow it up by, by a pet occasionally. So, which brings us to another very important question that which one has a better clearance, better overall clearance? Does a low transporter has a low clearance, has a high clearance, or a high transporter? It's a little complex, and the answer becomes a paradox. You would think that the high transporter has have a high high clearance because there are more urea creatinine saturation in the in the particular bags. It's a little complex. Like if you're doing short wells, then probably yes. But if you if some of the wells are getting longer, kind of uh, more than six hours, if even one or two, then the then you have to take an individual call on that. So if you look at the top top panel, you see the DP creatinine for a rapid transporter 
is the DP trade rate is high, which means they are getting more more saturation. So there's more clearance per exchange. That, that's that's obviously the correct thing. But if you look at the dialyzed volume, obviously the dialyzed volume in a slow transporter is more than the rapid transporter. So what you gain in terms of saturation, you may lose in terms of volume because the low transporter has much more volume. So if you combine these two top panels and you come out to the lower panel, you see that by about six hours time, if, you dwell, if you, one bag is there for six hours, then by that time, a rapid transporter, whatever clearance advantage it has, is kind of lost. Because the slow transporter with a much more artificial pressure volume. Because the final dialysis has the initial dialysis and the ultra ultra volume, and everything together has the same, same solid concentration. So what you lose by concentration, you gain in volume. So the answer can be a little counterintuitive at times. So, so this slide was made for an interactive audience. I'll skip it today. So how can you increase the clearance? Supposing you find somebody is having a low clearance. So what can you do about it? So there are three ways of increasing clearance. The easiest way is to increase the dwell volume. Each bag is two liters, but Baxter used to have bags at 2.5, it's occasionally available now. That's the easiest thing. If somebody is doing eight liters, you find that his vessel function is gone and you, you can't really uh, do, uh, you know, can't extract more, more solutes from there. The best is to increase the dwell volume. So two liters, you can make it 2.5 liters. Eight liters can become 10 liters. Six liters can become 7.5 liters. So that's a very easy way of. Of, and it's a very cost effective way because it is not going to cost you more, not, not so much. What happens? The gradient is longer because you are, the solute is coming into a 2.5 liters instead of 2 liters. So the gradient lasts a little longer. The downside is that there can be an increase in intraperitoneal pressure, so which some of the patients may mind. But many of the patients don't actually mind that because sometimes they will not even know if you just put 2.5. I'll give you an, an odd example. When you do an ascitic tap on a cirrhotic patient, so what's the what's volume? You very often find eight liters fluid in the abdomen. We tap three liters, four liters at times, sometimes even five, six liters when we are tapping. But if these patients can move around between the six, eight liters. So if you put 2.5 liters instead of two, many of the patients will, will not even know. And it's a very nice and a user friendly and a very cost effective way of increasing the clearance. The next is obviously the increase in the, the number of exchanges, what we did in our, in our case. The problem there is, supposing somebody already has a four hour, is, is doing four exchanges. So asking him to do five is going to get complicated. That he may not like, but somebody who is doing three exchanges, you can easily make it to four. That's kind of acceptable. The, the, the thing here that if you are doing too many exchanges, then the dwell time gets shorter. That's the, that's the backside. And if, the, if that gets shorter, then the saturation also gets shorter. And if you do want to summary do five exchanges, then the compliance, of course, there can be a compliance issue. And the third, and the least, least uh, I think, the, a less good option is to increase the dialyzer tonicity. So what you're trying to do here is more theoretical. I mean, I personally would not do that. That is increasing the clearance by artificial pressure. You have a certain, let's say somebody's doing all 1.5 exchanges and you get an artificial pressure of one liter. Now, if I change everything to 2.5 and I want to have an artificial pressure of 1.5, 1.6 liters total. So the, I have that much more, more volume clearance also. So that much more volume will also give me more solutes. So that may increase a little bit of solute clearance also. So, but this is that this can only be the last strategy. This can give rise to weight gain and it can rise to membrane damage. So not a nice thing to do, but sometimes, yes, you put to know it theoretically. So this uh, brings me almost to the end. So can there be a discrepancy in the expected and the actual clearance? Like you are given a certain prescription and the prescription is showing, telling you that, okay, I'm doing four exchanges, I'm doing everything. And you find this law is also really okay, but he's not looking good. His UV accretion is going up higher. Uh, you expect a little fresher look from him. So what's really happening in, in this kind of case? Two things can happen. The first one is known as dumping. So that means, you know, some, sometimes patients don't report it. And they don't, again, contrary to what I said before, some patients may not like putting the two liter, two liter. Some of them may say that I, my, my appetite is a little less. 
So they do what is known as dumping. So they put they put 500 ml into the drain bag and they take only 1500. So what is actually doing the peritoneal dialysis? You think it is two liters is going in the plumber. What is going is actually 1.5 liters, and this is not reflected in his logbook because he's writing two liters. So you think he is doing eight liters, but actually he's doing much less. He's doing six liters. So that, that way, one your his his clearance can come down. The second and a very important, a very interesting thing is one what I call compressing. Now this happens in people who mostly have the nurses coming in to do their do it uh, to to do their exchanges. So the nurses come in the morning. And they have their duty hours, they have to return, sometimes they return by train, and say so they try to do all the three exchanges within a short, let's say, an eight or nine hour period. So, what is happening? And they leave a long exchange, maybe that's I could explain, or uh, say for the fourth exchange, that's happening overnight. But what is happening? The three exchanges are done within eight hours' time. So, the saturation progressively falls. That's too less for them to extract uh, that amount of solute. The last exchange cannot compensate for that, as I told you, because the urea. In, in, in four hours time, whatever saturation was to be there is, is done. So if you do three exchanges in eight hours and you leave one long exchange for 16 hours, that is not going to compensate for this for the solid problem. So it's known as compressing. So these two, you should be aware of these two things which can happen. So this is my last slide. So you have to remember the prescription pitfalls that firstly, the change, we have to change the prescription along with the residual renal function loss. And you can expect that to happen any time between six months to two years, and particularly if there is a, uh, some other antecedent event, some hypertension, and that kind of thing. You should remember dumping and compressing. These are factors that can uh, be operating behind your back, and this will not be reflected in the patient's doctor. High creatinine is sometimes misinterpreted. High, high creatinine can be there in a good in a patient with good muscle mass. Patient may be adequately dialyzed with but with a high, high creatinine, that sometimes we don't want you to do anything. A muscular patient can have a treatment of 12, 13. You, you don't need to do anything. If you, if you are in doubt, do the kinetics properly. Do an adequate test, and you will be finding the response there. Sometimes I find that patients just are switched on to APD because the creatinine was high. So that is, again, APD is not, again, a panacea. This is not today's topic. It's a different topic. We can discuss sometime later. But for everything, APD is not a panacea. APD is a different physiology. Automated uh, machine dial uh, cycler dialysis, it is not just a, from a man to machine. It is not just manual to machine. It is a completely different physiology. And APD means that your dwell time is going to be short. So which means this will only suit the fast transporter. It will not suit the low transporters. If you think the creatine is high and therefore I give APD, that's going to be a long, long prescription completely. And secondly, you must give more importance to the fluid balance. If the patient who's not fluid overload, it generally does well. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Datta. You have discussed uh, about uh, prescription of PD and uh, critical aspects and incorporated with the case, your case presentation. Um, just to summarize, the main prescription of PD, as he has highlighted, uh, you have to see the three points. One is number one is the choice of fluid, whether we want to give 1.5 or 2.5 or um, icodestrin or 4.25. Then second is the uh, fill volume, uh, like you want to increase from 2 to 2.5 or 3 liters. And third, most important thing is dwell time. He has uh, focused most of his talk on uh, ultra filtration part and fluid management part. Mm, now mm, he he or uh, discussed he touched uh, in in one of the slides about D by P creatinine, mm, but uh, as uh, per uh, various clear, clearance uh, uh, parameters, uh, I will like your comment on, uh, on a creatinine clearance as well as KT by V. How much is the relevance in our day-to-day -day practice? Number one. Number two is. Various um, uh, adequacy tools are available, like we have peritoneal dialysis capacity, we have PD adequate by Bester, um, and where, uh, how much is the relevance in our day-to-day -day practice? These two, uh, and third, I would like to comment uh, your comments on, in our day-to-day -day practice, how often do we do PET tests in our routine management of 
these patients. Can you uh, please elaborate on these points, Dr. Dutta? Right. So I think we, for a routine cases, I I would not uh, do it nowadays, but you know, initially we used to do it. I would say that for somebody who is beginning his peritoneal dialysis, like who is early in their career, whenever you get an opportunity, you should do this because this will make you understand the kinetics very well and you will get a hang of, hang of things. Once you have understood that, then it is okay not to do because you, then you know, then you can pick and choose where you want to do. So like if you are in a, in a problem situation and you are unable to gauge whether the patient is adequately dialyzed or not, then you should, you should do everything. In a routine practice, that may not be necessary all the time. But to gain that understanding about PD, one needs to do it for, for some time. So for the new newcomers into, into PD, I definitely suggest that you do this. And you will be able to revise the physiology also if you, if you do this test. Uh, what was the other question? Uh, about uh, uh, clearance, bad treatment clearance and KTY. Yes. yes. So again, this will... Uh, so, so, so this is this partly answers that that question also. See the KTYV of of 1.7. It's good to know how this thing has evolved, and there are very simple ways of doing that also, and also using that that adequate. So I think the answer is the same for for these two. We are doing the kinetic study, basically looking at these two parameters. It is, and if a patient is all right, doing perfectly all right, his appetite is good. There's no food overload, and his he is in general very, very well. Then you may not need to do it. But if things are not not well, then you should do it. And there was a third question which you asked initially. I think the About first this question, use of a pe pe peritoneal dialysis capacity and PD adequacy in your practice. Yeah. So, so the PD adequacy test and the PET test you are actually doing doing together. Routinely. So when you are so again the same thing I'm saying. I will not do it routinely. Now. I can manage not doing it routinely because I can understand what is happening. But, some, but somebody who is beginning to you know, treat peritoneal and do peritoneal dialysis, I will ask him to do for the, for the first few cases. And they go hand in hand. You will do PET and you will do adequate both. Uh, now, uh, seeing the, uh, how cumbersome doing the Trodosti's PET test is, I yes. think uh, it has been modified, uh, which was, I think, a requirement. So in your modified PET test, uh, we are routinely using 4.25 percent. Okay. Yes. So I think that is quite practical. And in practical. fact, even our day-to-day -day practice, as we all do, just by seeing that well, um, uh, right. uh, volume. Uh, volume. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The artificial uh, Yes, which I showed. Yes. And uh, one thing I would like to uh, um, just highlight uh, uh, for all the attendees that uh, you showed one beautiful uh, that uh, slide where they have you had urea, tretinine and uh, Schuder, and that is the Annal of Internal Medicine 1978 paper by Popovich, Montreif, and Nall. Right, right. I will write all of all the uh, nephrology uh, the students to please remember few names, like this, otherwise you may not remember these names. I saw that paper by Popovich, Montreif, and Nall in 1978. So uh, because you have, please, uh, even for your exam, you must remember some of the names who really started PD. Uh, uh, in the world. Okay. Yes. But, yeah. Yes. Yeah, this is an important slide. Actually, yes, this, yes. It tells you the uh, data kinetics in this one, one slide. Yes. In fact, I'll see Popovich, Montreif, Nolf, all three are there in, in the author mm -hmm. in this paper. And there is one question, uh, Dr. Dutta. In CAPD, is it a good strategy to do Day dwells with glucose solution and night time dwells with hypodestrin. This is a question in the chat. <coughs> so I could explain this for the long dwell. <coughs> Sorry. So I think you have to look at the convenience of the of the uh, patient also. Traditionally, I mean, by and large, more people like to sleep uninterrupted. So they would like a long dwell in the night. They wouldn't like to you know wake up in the night to do an exchange. You will also have some people who have got long working hours. So there are some people who don't want to be interrupted during the day, like he is going to office. And if he's really ambulatory in the sense, ambulatory, and he is fully kind of 
occupied in his job and he wants a 10 hour period uninterrupted from the time he's going to office and he's coming by. You can use an iPod extender the daytime also, it doesn't matter. Is it entirely on your own convenience here? Yes, and there is another question. <coughs> should incremental PD uh, sh should be practiced in your practice? So I am a believer of that. But not that I'm able to do that as, as often. I am also a great believer of incremental hemodialysis. So uh, I think that is physiological. There is, no step, there is no step function in biology. You know that suddenly you say that you don't need dialysis, then suddenly you say, okay, you need dialysis three times from tomorrow. Or you need four exchanges from tomorrow. That I found a little harsh uh, initially also. So I am a believer of that. And I think patient can actually nicely transit and it is more acceptable for the patient if you say that you begin with one exchange or you begin with two exchange or you begin with a single iPod extreme exchange. We can do that nowadays. It's a very good ultrafiltration device and it's a very good gentle right if somebody comes back home and does a 12 hour iPod extreme to begin with. I think that is we we haven't studied that very well and PD is also going out gradually that is also another another matter. But I think it's a it, it's a good way to begin dialysis. Have you practiced uh, uh, two beds of icodestrin? Not only? really, not no. really. Because I will just tell you that, uh, so you, I, I may do it when there is this ultrafiltration is a very big problem. And I may do it intermittently, like for a short gap just to bail somebody out. But you have to understand that if you are doing only icodestrin two bags and you are, you are only putting in four liters, and so probably you're going to get two liters of water filtration from that. So your total value is probably six liters. For somebody who has lost his residual function, six liters may be inadequate clearance. So you cannot go on doing it for long. You can do it in a fluid overloaded state for a short time, but not continuously. Now I will uh, just touch another aspect. That is uh, Tenusa study and Edimet study. So from yes. these studies we know that how much is the impact of clearance and how much is the impact of KT by V. So what is your comment uh, uh, after uh, uh, both the studies uh, have been published? Uh, okay, what? I think it is a good point to raise for the postgraduates. Yes. So whenever you talk of PD and you come to this adequacy uh, area, so these two studies you have to know. So can you just study, let me tell you a bit of the story. I think that will just, you know, it will be an interesting story for you to know. So I think in 1998, we had our first PDSI conference in Bangalore. Dr. Yeah. Bala was there, yeah. Dr. Vijay was also there, I think. So we had, some of us had started PD in the early 90s, 92, 93, I began in 94. So, and in, in 98, we had our first meeting. So it was in Bangalore and around the same time, the Kenusa results had come out. Kenusa means Canada, USA. So the point at that time was that what is the adequacy index that is correct for peritoneal dialysis? How much dialysis, how much volume of dialysis you should administer to, to patients? So before the Canusa st study, the general KTYV target used to be 1.7. So the Canusa study told us that it depends totally on the volume of dialysis. The survival depends totally on that. And they said that the more volume you give, it is, it is better. So they had raised the targets to two. So when we went in for, and all our Indian patients were managing less than 1.7, even 1.5, 1.6 was perhaps the general average at that time. So we came back from the conference very depressed, saying that are we doing the right thing because our patients cannot afford more. Most of our patients were three exchanges. And they were saying that you have to do four or five exchanges to really reach out being of two. If you remember that, Dr. Prabhupada. So I came back. And I approached one or two of my patients, and I and I still remember this patient. His name was Mr. Nandi, and Mr. Nandi was already doing four exchanges, and he was doing real level. Okay, so I told him that look, we went to this conference, and then everybody is saying that this is inadequate for you, and he was a little large body guy, so you must do five exchanges. So I had a good exchange, and I was you know I tried to counsel him based on whatever targets. So at the end of that conversation. Mr. Nandi told me, asked me that, look, Dr. Dr. you have told me a lot of things, but you have never asked me a single question regarding how I am, how am I doing? So he was doing very well with, with the four exchanges. He was an intelligent man and he said, look, I don't, it's okay that you're telling me, but right now I am in no need to increase my exchanges. So he respected that and 
for the majority of our patients, we could not actually enhance the exchanges to one to two. What was the the based on the canvas of the doki had increased the target to two. Three years after this, the ADMEX study result came out. The ADMEX study was largely done in Mexico, where they actually did a for the prospective study, where they had patients targeting one point seven and another one hundred tar target two, and they showed comprehensively that the results are not too much different. So then the guidelines again reverted back to it as one point seven. So what was told about the Kenusa results later on that after the reanalysis they found. That it was a residual renal function, which is the actual denominator, which was which is actually the driving force, not so much the the peritoneal clearance. So now nowadays everyone believes 1.7. So this index came almost 20 years back. I think it was 2000 or 2001, two problems this came, and it still holds good. I think our still target should be 1.7. And the creatinine clearance, I think you asked a question. We are we rely more on the KDYB, not so much on the creatinine clearance. Because there are fallacies also, because if the residual renal function goes, the, the creatinine clearance falls much more than the KDYB. So that is a target which is impossible to manage at about 60 liters per uh, per week. If you once the residual renal function is lost, I think you can concentrate only on the KDYB. You really want to measure, and as I said, that you look at the hydration part. The hydration must be all right. If you focus on that, and the patient is otherwise all right, perhaps your radicals is all right. Also. Yes, Dr. Datta, you um, uh, have not mentioned about amino acid-based solutions. What is the uh, uh, indication, and should we use or not? So we don't have too much of experience on that. So uh, it came, and it's not really that uh, you know we have used in some cases. So that was not really related to the that was more related to nutrition. But only that's another topic. I didn't want to bring it here today. Regarding tidal PD, are we uh, using? No, not really. Not really. Okay. How frequently do you recommend PD for diabetic patients? So I don't uh, see occasionally. Uh, initially, that was a reservation, but when we started doing PD, it was no longer a reservation. Now PD as a whole is coming down, but in a in a given case, I will not really bring that as a very very uh, important factor, unless I see that the patient requirement of uh, insulin is already too high. Then perhaps I will think twice. Otherwise, for a standard case, I will not give it too much of a thought nowadays. And we have we have I could explain now. It will be an I could explain based prescription. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. One uh, last question, Dr. Datta, I would like to uh, ask is. Various agents also are being prescribed sometimes in PD, as literature shows, like ACE inhibitors and ARBs, vitamin D, and some others, even statins and various TGF beta inhibitors. What is your bit of? In fact, ACE inhibitor ARBs are quite often um, mentioned as a treatment to preserve membrane. What is your comment on, on uh, use of these agents in your day-to-day uh, -day practice of PD? So there was a paper which really showed that it's a bit counterintuitive, and I'll I'll tell you a bit uh, because uh, we use ACE inhibitors and uh, and ARBs. Let's say before uh, before dialysis, but when the patient is in advance, we generally tend to stop that, and we see that the creatinine drops a little, and the maintenance a little while go. This experience we already had with the in that background. Even in end-stage renal failure, transit dependence, maintaining the residual renal function, a little better maintenance on on that is a bit counterintuitive to me. But there was a paper, and probably follow one or two papers. This is mentioned as one of the ways to preserve, but it cannot be a very major way of of preservation. For preservation of residual renal function, I don't think you can do too much things about it. You have to stop. You have to reduce hypotension. You have to reduce dehydration, and you have to reduce. Uh, toxic agents like amyloid glycosides and uh, during peritonitis episodes and NSAID, which is kind of usual. These are these four are the main things. I don't think the, uh, even if there is a little effect, that cannot be a very big effect for preservation. This is a little sand and ARB. No, my uh, question was not for preserving renal residual renal functions. These are the to preserve the membrane uh, to retard the peritoneal membrane or remodeling, especially. Uh, anti-fibrotic. Okay. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. 
Okay, so I I will not be able to comment on that in a very confident manner. I think that is still in the realm of theory. I probably we need much, many many more studies and a real a practical proof of that that whether it really happens or not. Okay. So I would I would tend to continue ASM evidence because of the cardiac benefit primarily. Yes. I will not really give it mainly because it has a theoretical advantage on the peritoneum or on the residual renal function. So my patients on PD will have uh, ARDs or or ACE inhibitors because I am okay with the potassium because the potassium clearance is good. And so therefore, uh, for, for in, in the hemo patient, we find many of the times that the is is uh, potassium are high. So we tend to avoid it in their cases. But in PD, not that PD patients cannot get hyperkalemia, they can also get hyperkalemia, but by and large, initially they don't. And it allows you to give you uh, these ACE inhibitors and ARDs for a longer period. And probably the major benefit is, is cardiac. Well, about 25 years back, I, I, when we used to have five or six insertions every day in our center. In fact, at the time, I, I was routinely even monitoring C8 125 or so in these patients. Yes. Yeah, uh, for the mesothelial yes, function. Yes. Yeah. So, what, what is your comment? No, I, I haven't done that too much. Maybe you can give that comment, I think. Probably you have done. Yes. In fact, it, it, is a, it is a good indicator of mesothelial function that the mesothelium is healthy. So once in a while, you can actually, you should measure CA125 in the dialysate. So I think uh, we can um, have the uh, just concluding comment is the residual renal function is the most important thing whenever you are practicing PD. So every effort should be done to preserve renal, uh, residual renal function. And uh, in general, PD works at, uh, uh, much better than hemodialysis, especially in the initial two years. Whereas after that advantage is not usually seen. Uh, Dr. Datta, you want to have a last minute comment before we hand over to Professor Vijay K? So my comment is that this cannot be a forgotten art. It, I, think, I think it's our responsibility to keep this going. I mean, certain patients will definitely do well on PD. Yes, yes. And we have seen, so I have had patients doing 14, 15, 16 years. Not a huge number of them, but a fair number of them. So I think this has to be maintained as one of a good uh, renal investment therapy option. And the entire thing cannot be given more. And it's good to have very such many such options. Because a, a particular patient will need more than one kind of therapy. And like in the, you, you just mentioned in the COVID times. And now in the last two months also, I have to shift three patients because of complete access failure. You know, nowadays we are doing the palm cat. We used to do more PDs when the palm cat was not there. Yes. But when the fistula has to go, is to now we are doing palm cats patient also tend to remain on HD. But sometimes that uh, you know the palm cats are also failing because of central venous you know, stenosis, and we are again have to follow back on PD. So this art must be must be a living art. I mean, this we cannot completely forget. Yes, I I totally agree with your uh, concluding comment. Please, please, all the four uh, arm, four arm, arm on both sides have been already. Uh, explored both side neck have been explored patient is having central venous uh, thrombosis but still nobody is gives these patients any option about pd and the things are really um, uh, bad you know, from our and, point. and they are doing a fistula plasty yes, yes very yes. very expensive it's horrendously expensive and then that also doesn't last also too long you know you have got a 50 60 percent initial response and a one year survival is down to 20, 30% only. Many of these patients will do much better on PD. And PD initiation doesn't, doesn't cost so much. And so it, I, you know, the, uh, we are having 15 DNB students with us, five e every batch. Mm -hmm. And uh, nobody is interested in even entering the C PD room. We have a PD <laughs> center in our hospital. I know. But, but even I tell you, they cannot do manual exchange. I know none of the students can do a hemodialysis also. No, no, no uh, DNB student can do independently hemodialysis. <laughs> but PD exchange, we, uh, earlier we used to teach every, every resident, but now the things have deteriorated to, to that extent that somebody, there is a total dislike for this procedure. And I'm, I am sure this, uh, to, uh, these kind of thoughts will definitely stimulate them to uh, learn about this excellent modality of renal replacement therapy. Uh, over to Professor Vijay Khair, sir. No, I think I, I must say that I uh, am so delighted that uh, Arup actually is a different kind of a speaker, a person who I consider 
extremely intelligent uh, physician who utilizes uh, the research based evidences for individualizing and prescriptions are based on that individual and he modifies treatments accordingly he looks at every patient from that perspective and i've always been impressed by the prescriptions that he writes and uh, the patients who come uh, many times we exchange patients uh, obviously patients travel yeah. to various places and i i find uh, patients coming back and uh, giving this feedback about him and i always had huge respect and today's talk again emphasizes that he didn't mention about the the evidence is here and there but he talked about the practical aspects of individualizing individual patients for four episodes of fluid overload how each time it was a different and unless you understand it you cannot say that it was the same which had happened last time it was a different cause of fluid overload this time and i think that's exactly what uh, i would want to convey to students is that you must look at every patient and then try to see how would you make the evidence that is existing in the literature to utilize it to best fit into that patient and i think individualizing patient treatment and patient related outcomes are far more important than the clinical determinants that you may be having i think it's is extremely important to look at those kind of outcomes and i feel that aru fits into that uh, extremely well and i'm so delighted that i was here throughout the uh, the whole session i must say that every student has asked for peritoneal dialysis lectures and i am i agree i echo the the sentiments expressed by you as well as by anil that pd is a neglected a dwindling kind of a modality and unfortunately not being utilized as effectively even in my own center i am very glad that at agpgi we i handed it over to amit and amit has done a tremendous job of establishing peritoneal dialysis as one of the treatments although it's going down there as well uh, and but i i agree that pd i don't know for what reason and why is not coming up i'm trying to stimulate many of my colleagues to to get into peritoneal dialysis but somehow uh in our own center i i am quite disappointed to say that we haven't been able to set up an, an equally good center for peritoneal dialysis uh, as we had been able to do at sanjay gandhi post graduate institute but that was related predominantly to the initial interest by the faculty there and and that's uh, that's how it is but i i agree that is is a very good alternative to some patients it may not be a good alternative to all patients but certain patients obviously we should look at this option and especially patients are living now longer and longer on dialysis and as mentioned by you vascular access is becoming depleted so you will should look at this option uh, and try to find out appropriate patients for peritoneal dialysis uh, i must thank uh, both anil as well as aru for an excellent excellent lecture and i hope the students will take the the messages in the right direction and in the right way and uh, will take all the good things that uh, arup said about uh, optimizing uh, treatment prescriptions in a peritoneal dialysis patient and uh, i must thank mqr also to give us this opportunity to carry on this forward and we will continue to bring forth mentor speaks Uh, program uh, now i think uh, this is the last for this year and probably we'll start refresh on the next year now and thank you thank you with that thank, thank you, you arup yeah. for an thank excellent you. and thank you anil thank you sir thank you so much thank, thank you thank you dr sir thank you so much thank, thank you. you thank you all the eminent faculty for the report of wisdom uh, have a good night sir have a good I, night. I, okay i like to have the feedback from the from the audience what yes sir sir they are already thanking you on the chat box all <laughs> thank you so where is the chat box yes, let me see uh, can i see that there is a message from uh, uh, weather and a question acha okay the yeah. question answer thank you so much uh, thank you so much sir rup sir and kate okay. so it's very well taken for thank sure you so So thank, thank you so much sir thank you all for so, uh, your arup i must say that you will come back 
into this program is not is not the last time that you are speaking oh, okay. i'm sure i okay. will i will uh, like to utilize you for many I was, other things for i was school. planning a, i was planning a long sabbatical which i was i was, no, no, I was you, telling you, Bada, one day no but i know you you managed to bring pain and i enjoy doing this too no no, so no i think i i know that people like you should not be remaining behind <laughs> the scenes i think I'm you sorry. should be right on the front and Thank you so you're much. such a good speaker and you can bring forth a different perspective of see a lot of us talk about the evidences the recent trials and these but to put it into a practice and how to put it into a patient perspective is extremely important and you are so good at it and i think these things are extremely important to young people as to how they could sort of modulate all this uh, into a practical management of patients on day to day basis Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.